glad to be here today on this stage. I love TED Talks. How many of you watch TED Talks? It's unanimous. All right, great. And it's, I'm honored to be able to contribute one. As you might guess, I am fascinated by the ones done by entrepreneurs. And since 1984, uh, when TED Talks started, there have been over 2,000 talks given by entrepreneurs, founders, and owners. You'd watch those, and you watch how many more there are now than 1984, and you would draw the conclusion that startups are happening more and more often. More people are becoming entrepreneurs than ever before. Let me show you a diagram. In 1949, in America, 18% of people were self-employed. By 2015, only 6.4%. So at a time when we would think it's growing and it's more popular than ever, the reality of it is it's less popular than it's been for more than 40 years. So let me tell you a personal story to help you understand part of this. This is my family. Now, this picture is 18 years old. It was the last photo we took when my parents were both healthy and we could get all the families together. Let's start with my parents. It may not be obvious. You look at me and say, ah, well, that's an American. No, I'm a grandson of Europe. My parents were born in Europe, in Western Poland, in 1925. And in 1939, the Nazis rolled in, put my parents in concentration camps. They were the fortunate few. They survived. They came to America as immigrants in 1949, when 18% of Americans were self-employed. Over the course of their lives, my father started four, I'm sorry, my father started seven for-profit businesses. My mother started four charity non-profit businesses, three of which are still operating today. Both my parents died years ago. So this was the first generation, steeped entrepreneurs. Let's talk about what happened after that. Oh, by the way, just, yes, my parents really did, that, there, that is 1947 uh, immigrant dress in Europe. Uh, by that time, they were actually immigrants now living in a DP camp in Germany. So let's go back. So the parents had kids. That's my sister, her husband, my wife, who's here today, and me, obviously much younger. So among, uh, with us, uh, each of us, has been self-employed a part of the time and employed by other people part of the time. So where my parents were pretty much lifelong entrepreneurs, my sister, my wife, my brother-in-law are only part-time entrepreneurs over the course of our lives. And we had children. My sister had uh, two girls and we had a boy and a girl. Between them, uh, three of the four have never ever been self-employed. Remember, they're 18 years older in the photo here. One of them was uh, self-employed only briefly. So we went from having people who were totally self-employed for almost all their working life to being people who were part-time self-employed to even less part-time self-employed. That is one of the ways that we see more, uh, uh, fewer and fewer people becoming self-employed. The other thing is, take a look at me, note my age especially young people. You have to look a long time because you don't like to look at old people. So the thing is that uh, there are a lot of old people who started uh, businesses. They're the, the baby boomer generation, and they're now my age. And what are all my friends doing? Retiring or talking about retirement. So what do the entrepreneurs do? If they can't find someone to buy the business, they close it and go retire. So I see more and more and more of this kind of retirement. So we see that again, a reason why there's less self-employment. You might be saying, is self-employment important? And it's vitally important. First off, self-employment, these entrepreneurs with their passionate, cool ideas are the source of most of our new products and services. Whether you're looking for the next product that's being funded on Kickstarter, whether you are involved in the gig account economy and you've used Airbnb or Uber, uh, or you work for them, uh, if you are interested in hybrid organizations, Tom Shoes sells us shoes for profit, but then takes a large part of the profit and gives shoes to people in third world countries when they need them. Hybrid organization, entrepreneur behind it. All of these are possible because entrepreneurs go out with their wonderful ideas and dreams and make it into reality. Other entrepreneurs go out into our communities and give us that 
those things we couldn't get otherwise. This is the Zatari refugee camp in Jordan. Most of the refugees there are Syrian. When they first came to this camp fleeing the turmoil in Syria, there was no food, there was no water, there was nothing for them to do and nothing for them to buy. And so the first people who settled there started trading what they had with them and what skills they could sell to one another. And so it was a tiny little market that would occur once a week and then twice a week and then every day and more people came. Some people went to the city farther behind and bought, uh, bought products and brought it to the camp and sold it to the refugees. But these people created this and literally built a market. This road is actually the main street of the current marketplace at the Zatari camp. You're probably now saying, why is this crazy American raising the issue about a refugee camp a thousand miles away? Just to give you an idea of a, a kind of important situation we would all recognize. But let me give you one. If you go two hours outside of Madrid, or if you went two hours outside of my hometown of St. Louis, you would discover people in almost the same situation. Uh, Primark, Carrefour's, Walmart, don't go to these small towns. How do these people get their goods? How do they buy new clothes? How do they get their food? They get it when an entrepreneur says, I will start a business and get, get this in here and sell it to you. So people, entrepreneurs give people the missing products and services they need to live. There are other reasons to start a business. If something is important to you, something you're passionate about. The only way to make sure it gets done is do it yourself. Start an organization to achieve it. If you want to leave a legacy, if there's something that you think is important to be done for another group, start a business. And one other, which fits in, as uh, if you think about my, my parents' story, the fact is for immigrants, very often the best way to become part of the society and part of the economy is to become self-employed. And we'll come back to look at that. So. I showed you the picture of the decline. Do we know what causes it? Well, it turns out we do. It's worse in countries like ours, the US and, and Spain. Let me explain that. Every year, there's a study called the Global Entrepreneurship Monitor. It's a worldwide study. Uh, last year, it took place in over 60 countries where they survey the entire population, a sample of the people, and ask them about their interest in entrepreneurship. And they've discovered over the years that there are three kinds of economies. The ones that have the highest level of entrepreneurship in the blue bar are not the countries you would normally expect that to be. Iran, Egypt, Peru, Belize, Burkina Faso. In all of those countries, people make a living through what's called a factor-driven economy. They make their living by farming, by herding, by fishing, by forestry, by mining. Very labor intensive, lots of small family farms and herders and folks like that. So high levels of self-employment. As we move to mechanization and industrialization, now we're talking about countries like Bulgaria, South Africa, Indonesia, Turkey, and Brazil. These are called efficiency-driven countries or efficiency-driven economies. And in those where you now have plants, you have factories, people move from the farms and the uh, rural areas to the, uh, take jobs in the city and work in the factories. Fewer and fewer people are self-employed. What happens when you move from an industrial economy to an idea economy? And this is where we live. In Spain, in the rest of the EU, in the United States, Taiwan, Israel. In these idea, innovation-driven economies, we have even the lowest level of self-employment anywhere in the world. Why is that? Well, the researchers have discovered there are four major uh, issues to, to watch. One, do people see a lot of opportunities? The more opportunities they see, the better. If they see opportunities, do they feel capable of pursuing that opportunity? And if they do feel capable, do they let themselves do it or do they have a fear of failure that holds them back? And if you have all three of those, you get through all three of those, then do you have an intention to start that organization of your own? So, Spain, the US, how do we do? We do terribly. We have the lowest level of, uh, we see fewer opportunities than other people. We feel less capable to exploit those opportunities than people in these other kinds of economies. We uh, uh, have the greatest fear of failure. And in the end, we have the fewest people who talk about starting an organization.
Another reason why the numbers are going down. So, I'm not going to leave you without some solutions. First off, me, as an American entrepreneurship professor, want to congratulate all of you, I believe you're all pretty much here members of the EU, your country, your joint country, your confederation, beats my country in entrepreneurship. In particular, you beat us in entrepreneurship education. And I applaud you for that. You've done a wonderful job. How did it happen? In 2006, there was an EU gathering, as there is every day of the year somewhere in the EU. But this one was focused on entrepreneurship education. And the group in 2006 passed the Oslo Accords, which mandated in the EU lifelong entrepreneurship education. And as true of all the EU initiatives, over the past 10 years, some countries have done better and some countries have done not as well. But the fact is, the countries in the EU that have made the most progress on the Oslo agenda have done a tremendous job of teaching young people about entrepreneurship and teaching them the skills to master entrepreneurship, the opportunity, the capability, decreasing their fear of failure and increasing their desire and intention to start entrepreneurship. And you've actually done a wonderful job of measuring this. And the EU leads the world in its ability to consistently get young people to want to start small businesses. So my hat's off to you. That's what your government's doing now. What can you do? Keeping with all those 2000 TED Talks, let me one more time, the 2001st person to say this. Keep dreaming and keep pursuing your dreams. Keep trying to find a way to start a business, a way to do things that's better, or a way things to do something important that isn't being done now. The funny thing is now, you could, at the break, walk out with your credit card. You could use the TED uh, Wi-Fi login. You got 10 minutes, you could start a business. You could buy product from a wholesaler. You can open a store on eBay or Amazon and start reselling it and have the, the material you bought from the wholesaler either drop shipped or sent to Amazon and they'll ship it for you. You'll never see the, you'll never see the, equip, uh, the material that you bought, you'll just see the money. If you're not a product sort of person, maybe you're an artist, maybe you uh, can do caricatures, maybe you're an accountant, you can do books, all right? There are websites for that, like Fiverr or uh, Upwork. And for either of these, you can always start your own e-commerce site, but it takes more than 10 minutes to do that, but you certainly could. And if you're a programmer, getting a, an app into the Google Play Store, the uh, Apple Store is very easy very uh, uh, and very cheap. So like Nike says, just do it. It's never been faster, it's never been easier. You can always also do a pop-up business. This old man is selling his artwork by the ocean, which actually looks to me like a perfect way to spend the day. Uh, you know, and the thing is that you don't have to have a lot involved. Uh, it's a temporary sort of thing. You do it when you want to or when you think there's a crowd there. Having been in Madrid now for two days, I am amazed how the, about the crowds, day and night. It's, it's glorious. You know, I'm sitting, but I'm sitting here and it's like, oh, this would be a great place to put up a shop. You know, this is, <laughs> was, and my wife's looking at me and saying, can you please give it up? So, <laughs> but it, it really, it, it, if you're doing a part-time, you know, weekend sort of thing, it's really a very easy thing to do, very open sort of thing. The other thing is to buy a business uh, and, how is this possible? Well, look at this guy. To be honest, he's about my age, although I think I came out better on the hair deal. <laughs> but here's the deal. Um, the amazing thing is that the elderly, the baby boom generation that, yes, I am a part of, uh, actually had started more businesses than anywhere. These are the US numbers, but it's virtually the same in, uh, in the EU. So in the US, one out of six businesses are owned by people my age or his, his age. How much longer are we gonna work? My friends are thinking about retirement. I'm beginning to think about it. So you look at this guy, and he, like every entrepreneur I've ever met, he wants one million euros for his business. If you go to him the first day he thinks about retirement, you say, I wanna buy your business, one million euros. So why? He says, one million euros, take it or leave it. Okay, good, leave it. Because here's a psychological trick. He gets closer to retirement. He's going to reach a point where he has a young worker who's worked for him for like, like six, eight years, and the kid's just getting married. 
and they're going to start a family. He's going to have to tell this kid, I want you to find a job somewhere else because you need a stable income to raise your children, and I can't guarantee you that anymore. And when that kid is walking out the door for the last time, his heart's going to break. That kid's not just an employee, that kid is family. And when he takes one of his oldest customers, and the customer is talking about plans for two and three years ahead, he says, you know, maybe you should talk to my, the, my competitor across the street. He'll be able to take care of you. I might not be here all that time. It's going to kill him. And the million dollars will go down and down and down. And if you, a bright, passionate person, come up to him and say, I'm going to buy your business. And I can't pay for it right now. But I'll come in, you teach me to work, you retire. I will send you a check every month. And if you die, I'll send your wife a check every month. And if she dies, I'll send your estate the check every month until I've bought your business. I bet you he'll go for less, a lot less than a million dollars. 10%, I'm sorry, 16% of your businesses are going to close or get bought in the next 10 years. The opportunity is unprecedented. Last. I saw this photo in a news feed, and it said, that seems, I just, emotionally, I connected with this photo. And it was because it reminded me of a photo, there are my parents again. This was a train in Germany, outside the DP, this place persons camp they were in. And this was their start, the start of their trip to America, a train that took them to Bremenhaven, Germany, where they took a boat, and eventually got to Memphis, Tennessee, where I, I grew up. So why? are immigrants important? Immigrants are important because they start businesses. They go self-employed more than native-born people. In the US, it's actually 20% higher. In EU countries, that's low. In many of the EU countries, it's 25, 30, 33, 40%, as high as 40%. And that's, that's a significant difference in the number of businesses people are starting. They often start selling to other immigrants, like in the Zatari camp. But a lot of them start selling not just to immigrants, but to the native born, and a few. This list are famous American companies, and you know all of them. You all have Kraft food in your, your freezer, Procter & Gamble uh, cleaning products, AT&T, eBay, Yahoo, Instagram, Intel. Intel Inside, right? Every one of those companies was founded or co-founded by an immigrant. And we show the countries. So realize those immigrants can make an enormous difference in every level of your society. So let me go back and tell you the lessons my immigrant parents gave me. Like, they started with nearly nothing. But if you seek, prepare, pursue, and persevere, you can make a difference on your own. I encourage you, take the chance and give another chance to our own immigrants. Thank you.